So welcome to a very special, a very special episode of The World Shapers. <laughs> um, normally World Shapers is only audio and you may be listening to just the audio of this episode, but uh, this also has a video component uh, thanks to the good folks at uh, Daw Books. And um, my special, my very special, my special guest is Julie Cerneda, who was one of the very first uh, guests of the World Shapers. Uh, when I started back in August 2018, there were uh, like four people I, I asked right away, Robert J. Sawyer, Julie Cerneda, Tanya Huff, and John Scalzi, and they all said yes, and that got me off to a real great uh, to start. And here we are four and a half years in later, and this will be a little different because we're going to, uh, you know, normally I ask the questions. <laughs> but uh, today we're going to cross-examine each other, I guess, and uh, because we each have a, a, a recent book from uh, Daw. Mine is The Tangled Stars. Julie's is uh, To Each His Own. I got that title right, didn't I? No, I so. not, not even close, no. <laughs> <laughs> to Each This World. I don't know why that came, came out that way. But... That's okay. I kept saying a tangled web for yours, so we're even. <laughs> <laughs> or even anyway to to each his world and the tangled stars and uh, so we're going to talk about those and so uh, julie welcome to this this special episode thank you ed this is absolutely wonderful i'm so delighted i'm and to have the chance to read your book was also such a treat and i've actually read it twice so that i can answer questions if you need them <laughs> oh, well, you may have to answer questions it's been a while since i've read it so <laughs> i know that feeling <laughs> Yeah, people people will ask you questions about your book. Well, what happens if you write a lot, as you know, is that people say, "Oh, so how's your book doing?" You say, uh, "Which one?" <laughs> or, or, which one? Especially now that I've switched from science fiction to fantasy for the next few years, it's it's uh, this is a big nugget in my brain. So it's, I'm glad to, t to to bring it out again and to talk to you, of course. And of course, uh, we have known each other for a long time, not just because we're both authors, but because we're both Canadian authors. Uh, so we've met each other at conventions and and dot dinners and and things like that over We're the buddies. years. So we live a long way apart. Uh, you're in Ontario, and I'm in Saskatchewan. So uh, <laughs> that's I, like being we, across Europe. <laughs> when we first moved up here, it was 1967, and uh, uh, of course that was Expo 67. We moved we moved up here from Texas. I was eight years old. I had heard about Expo 67 in school, and I thought we're moving to Canada. I'll get to go to Expo 67. And my parents had to explain to me that Montreal was basically the same distance from where we lived in Texas as it was from Saskatchewan. I was no closer at all, uh, so I still didn't get to Expo 67. <laughs> now you know we lived in Saskatchewan from 77 to 79 in Saskatoon, I should say. Yes, our paths did not cross at that point. No, but we were both around at the same time. We were. <laughs> um, now, you actually, of course, you were there. You were studying biology, and that that uh, ties a lot into your book. So maybe why don't we start, uh, uh, you explain a little bit about what your book's about so you don't give away anything, because yours will be hard to talk about to the very end without giving away some. <laughs> and yours as yeah, well. Yeah, I guess that's true, yes. It's true. So, There's some big spoilers at the end of that one. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, so we why don't you give a, that. <laughs> give a little synopsis of yours and I'll give a little synopsis of mine and then we'll talk about them. Sure. Uh, to Each This World is a standalone science fiction. It's set in our far future. Um, it's about a period of time in which uh, humanity has sent forth sleeper ships to colonize other stars, other planets around other stars. And the time lag is 200 years in communication. So we don't know what's they don't know what's happened. Meanwhile, um, the humans that uh, are part of the story have formed a partnership of sorts with aliens that have wonderful technology that will let them wish to cross space. So time is no longer the issue. The problem is these aliens also warn that, oh, you can't have any other worlds but Earth. You have got to get them all back. So the story begins pretty much with that crisis point of, of we have to bring everyone home who left us 200 years ago. And that's a lot of people who have no idea what earth is like now or even they've never met an alien so it's 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 a fun ride it is a very fun ride and uh, uh when i got into the last uh, portion without giving too much away but there's this cross planet trek with everything chasing <laughs> chasing your character <laughs> and trying to kill him <laughs> it was uh it reminded me a lot of uh some classic science fiction uh stories that was the that beginning time. of the original draft Oh, you started there to begin. I with. started there with the with the crash in the jungle and the running through and everything trying to eat you, and 
I realized about halfway through the book that I, not me. I need to set things up. I just don't feel comfortable unless the readers know as much as I do going forward. So uh, that became a nugget towards the last third of the book. So you started there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then um, you you built in the backstory, I, basically. I, I basically wrote to it. Yes, yes. Mm. And always an interesting pro process. Well, I guess I should mention what The Tangled Stars is about. Um, Please. The Tangled Stars is a far future humorous space opera heist novel <laughs> that features uh, one of the main characters is an AI uplifted talking cat who becomes a starship captain. Uh, that's that's how I always describe it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about uh, Cooper Douglas, who's a kind of a con man and uh, making a living as he can. Uh, I always think the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, Dukes of Hazard line about uh, making their way the only way they know how, just just a little bit more than the law will allow. I think that sums up Coop's uh, life. And uh, he's out salvaging, um, he, he's on a, a salvage vessel with his AI uplifted talking cat, Tybalt. And uh, he discovers that the network of uh, multiverse adjacent space-time tunnels, masts, which is my a way that the humans used to get around uh, the universe had collapsed many years ago. And he discovers that one of them appears to have reopened and he really needs to get out of the solar system. And he knows where there's a ship that might, there's only one ship in the whole solar system left that can traverse these things. And it's in a museum on earth. So he decides he'll go get it. And he enlists the help of a former lover and now cop on the moon, Lisa Gray. And uh, they assemble whom they need and they go and uh, it's not spoiling too much to say that they get the ship. It's not even a spoiler to say that they do get out of the solar system because the book is called The Tangled Stars. And if they didn't, there wouldn't be any point in calling it that. Fair um, enough. So the book is basically about them getting this uh, this ship and uh, trying to escape uh, uh, kind of a crime lord from the outer system who's after them and also wants the ship. I think that sums it, it up pretty it, well. It does. It does. Um, although I will say... Uh, you addressed it as if it, the, the humor was the, the biggest part of it. And to me, the humor is very lightly done and fits the characters very, very well. And it's it, to me, it's far more of a, a character driven. And there's a whole lot of, uh, of really cool ideas in here and close calls. And it's almost felt a bit to me like a spy thriller in a sense, more than a, a little more, a little darker than just, you know, um, it's not a giggle book. There are moments when you smile, but those are moments to relieve a very great tension that you've developed throughout it. So I, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't introduce it that way, but make sure you also tell people that there's guts here. Lots of yeah, guts. Well, I do like to, yeah, and that is true. It certainly has real stakes and uh, real peril and uh, people die <laughs> along the way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I, that is true, but I guess it's, uh, it, it, I think that's the way I always approach uh, humor in my stories. There's often a lot of it, but I never do a story that doesn't have something real happening in it. It's just the way the characters react to it that lightens it up a little bit. I don't know if it's quite Shakespearean comic relief or not. I wouldn't want to compare myself to Shakespeare, but I think there is some of that going on. There's lots of humor in your book, too, between the characters. And uh, I particularly like like uh, Flip, who's a polymorph. Um, uh, and he reminded me, I have to say, he reminded me a little bit of some of the AIs that I have in the Tangled Stars, actually. <laughs> oh, we definitely were going down the same path there. Well, I wanted, um, well, obviously I wanted the AI for, for many particular reasons. He's very useful, uh, also as a foil for, uh, my very human character, but I also using him the same way you did to explore that idea of what makes their minds different from ours. And yet what can make them the same? I think mine have gone further toward becoming the same than yours have. Yours have these really cool, interesting selfishness in them that is very appropriate. And, and Tybalt himself, you know, persona, you expect that from a cat. You don't necessarily expect it from where else you see it. So that was very cool. Well, and I think what's interesting about yours, um, the book, as I said, is very, very grounded in biology all the way through. And in a way, what Flip is and what that that uh, kind of construct is, is kind of an alien biology going on there as well. Even though they are a, uh, an artificial life form, they are still a life form and they have their own biology, it seemed to me. Do you think that's a fair way to describe it? 
Oh, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that, uh, I think that's probably a spoiler. So we won't get too much into it, but the polymorphic technology, like robots that are capable of rearranging their form, was a gift from the comet, the aliens that arrived in Earth orbit with all this tech that the Earth, 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 humans are going, oh my gosh, look at this. And they gave it to humans, but humans already had AIs to the point where AIs were actually part of the civilization and they had a vote in the government and it it was expected that and they were they had rights i mean they were full citizens of earth so at this point new earth so to add that feature of i i'm i'm an earther but now i've got this casing that's alien makes it a very interesting place to play with well let's go back uh, um and talk about where you know where do you get your ideas i know it's a... <laughs> <laughs> but what what was the impetus for this particular story and you have been writing fantasy uh now you're back to science fiction with this one so what was the uh what was the impetus for this well interesting interestingly enough i actually wrote um i wrote i was doing nothing but science fiction for four years and this is the culmination of it ah. uh, before that was a year of fantasy and before that was more i've been bouncing back and forth but the impetus for this started back uh over 20 years ago i wrote a, a story for one of the greenberg anthologies uh, called space it was space stations and I, I invented a biological barrier on a planet and I really liked the idea and I played with it and I sort of thought at some point I'm going back to this and I thought at the time I might go back to that story but it wasn't going to be that I I, I just thought no 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 this is this is going to be bigger than that so I just mulled it on you know for the next few years until Sarah needed a story from me and I went here you go well, and in my case, I, I've been asked where the idea came from, and I can't actually figure it out. Um, except there's definitely the influence of having binge watched The Expanse in there. <laughs> I think okay, yeah. I wanted to do something in the solar system and outer space. Uh, and originally, I even thought, you know, I'm going to make this really hard science with the way they get around the solar system. Then I thought, no, because I don't have time for that. <laughs> so I gave them, a, you know, advanced space drives and artificial gravity and all those things that we do and we don't want to uh, to deal with, <laughs> with real space flight. Um, Although I did like the idea that the guy who invented the first drive just is still going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> that, was, that was poignant and, and probably absolutely accurate. <laughs> so uh, that was where some of it came from. That's where the setting came from. And then, uh, the, the, well, I'd always wanted to do a, a cat character. Uh, either huh. in fantasy or in science fiction and and uh, I realized that if I was going to do him I I wanted to give him you know the ability to speak so you can get his side of things and the only way I could see to getting there within a science fictional setting was some sort of uh, uh, AI uplift and mm -hmm. uh, some sort of uplift I suppose it could have been genetic but then you'd have to worry about you know brain size and all that sort of thing so that's where that all came from. And then after that, I really don't know. <laughs> Does that happen to you? Do you end up writing a, a book and people ask you what was the impetus for it? And you don't really remember anymore. You just know that you started and it, it turned out good. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, no, I can't say that because I usually spend about, uh, uh, you know, five to 10 years before I, I write a book, uh, getting ready to write a book. So by then I'm pretty well locked into a path. Um, little bits can fly in that I don't expect coming. The, uh, um, I have, uh, magma pots and those came about because I, I interviewed with a, uh, the professor, actually the head of geology at Carleton University. And I wanted to talk to him about power systems and underground things and whatever. And he said, oh, magma pots. And I went, magma pots. <laughs> so didn't see those coming. They're integral to the book. Uh, so some things arrive serendipitously, but generally the, the, the meat of the story for me, I know exactly where, where it was, even to the moment, to the day. Um, so that part, yeah, that part's easy. I was going to ask you though, um, I meant to go back to the book and look, but I forgot. Was there a litter box? Uh, I think it's mentioned in passing, but it doesn't play an important part <laughs> in the story. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just imagining him on this, you know, the various ships and places he gets to and, and thinking, is he carrying a litter box? <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't emphasize it. But uh, there was some reference. I mean, he, yeah, that's a good point. But 
for the future book, you may want to have some really cool far out, far out high tech litter box that has to go with them. <laughs> I think I may have mentioned a self cleaning thing on the original ship, but uh, yeah, I should have made go. a point of them transporting that from ship to ship. It would have been funny, actually. It would have been funny because <laughs> the bat, the tuna was was good enough. I mean, you know, knowing that you couldn't eat the, the 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 food they were offering was was, was was that's not a spoiler. That's just an important tension in the story. <laughs> I did go back and write the, well, I, I pulled the, and when I was reading yours, I thought, you know, uh, as they go from world to world, there's any number, you could tell a short story on any of those worlds from the other side of the people who are on that world when this guy comes in and has this this uh, devastating message for them and all of that. Um, do you ever pull sure. short stories out of, I did pull a short story out of the Tangled Stars for uh, Shapers of Worlds Volume 2. Uh, the second anthology I kickstarted with guests of the podcast, and uh, <clears throat> it's a chunk of the novel that I then built out into a, a short story that tells the backstory of where Tybalt came from. Do you ever pull short oh. stories out of your your novels? I have done it. Um, I've done a couple of novellas based on my fantasy series, to, uh, Night's Edge, from A Turn of Light to Play of Shadow, mostly to keep my hand in and to keep readers engaged when I knew I wasn't going to be going back there for about uh, you know eight or nine years. So I've done that. Um, the Essen books, the web shifters, I'm constantly writing short stories out of there, mostly because she's just so fun to write. And if I ever feel like I need a brain break, I, I just, uh, or brain involvement, I just plunge into those. But for each is a little different because there's a lot of material that's not in each. And we all harbor hopes one day of being on TV. And I keep thinking if I want to do, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a sh episode of the week, a different planet of the week would be a very cool thing to do. So I've got more planets. I don't think I'll take them out and show them yet. That makes sense. <laughs> Everybody should have a few planets tucked away in the back somewhere. <laughs> I, feel that. I feel that. Yes. Well, of course, that this this uh, podcast is called The World Shapers, and one reason for that is because whenever you write in the future, well, whenever you write at all, I would argue, you have to build a world, because even if you're writing mainstream fiction, it's not our world, it's a version of our world, but you're still building your world, which totally. is different. Um, so when it comes to that, you say you spend a lot of time uh, working up, you know, to the actual writing of the book is a lot of that spent on, especially with all the biology and everything there must be a lot of time spent on figuring all that out in the world building side of things i have well actually i feel like turning on the video again but i won't but i have a uh my journal here i was going to show uh yeah i do i do a lot of it mostly it's a case of um I, i'm sure you do this too you, you sort of say well for this this book Anything I come across about this topic will probably be interesting to include. So you throw it into that folder. I literally do have folders and journals and things. I keep that tidbits in. So I accumulate like like a, a, the Rolling Stone and the Moss. I, I actually get all gooed up on ideas before I start writing. I sort of need a sort of critical mass of cool ideas. Also, for each of the worlds because you're there so quickly, I mean, it's an emergency setting. You're going to just fly and get an impression and then yank out again. I had to really be aware of the numbers. Uh, so I've done the math. I did a lot of math before this book because that tells me what I can do and what I can get away with and what makes sense. So what would be the reproductive rate if people had a good place to live? What would it be if they had a terrible place that they were living for 200 years? That kind of thing. So I spent a lot of, I felt better because I had that information when I started and moving forward. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. I'm not nearly that organized. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about, you know, all the years and I'm thinking, well, for me, it's like, well, I need to send a new proposal to DAW. So let me, here's five or six ideas. And, and it might be, if I develop it, it's about uh, 10 pages of single spaced development. And then I usually kind of launch into it and figure it out as I go <laughs> so and there you know what there's nothing wrong with that I mean my my thing is I've, I tend to be writing a book and have several waiting to be written so for me it's much more a case of laying the groundwork because I know what's coming um I knew I was going to be writing the fantasy novel next for example back in a turn of light so months ago I started I wrote a new novella. I, wrote, I started researching those books again and getting the information back in my head and the tone of voice. And it was still a bit of a, of a shaky start. It's going very well now. So that that kind of prep is important for how I work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you're writing a series, does um, as I've you are, on, uh, as I've been on, as I and I have, I've been on panels about this, and uh, I think my my approach doesn't help me <laughs> in that regard because it's very easy to write something as a throwaway line in book one that in book, especially if you're dealing with magic you get to book three and you think i'd really like the character to be able to do this but i said back in book one that nobody can do this and uh, you've you know I mean, it's just a challenge you have to deal with oh, gosh. but uh, yeah suppose if you planned everything out much more tightly perhaps you wouldn't encounter those uh, little bumps as often my very first book a thousand words for stranger i had a throwaway line so i wanted somebody to say something like we would say Oh, heavens, or something like that, something vaguely implying a religion. So I have somebody say Biosiris, which is just a throwaway, you know, Greek, you know, Egyptian god kind of name. And then 17 years later, I'm writing the prequels and I'm going, I can't leave that line alone. I have got to figure out how it gets in the mouths of characters that now we know are aliens who shouldn't have anything to do with Egyptian <laughs> gods or anything like this. And I, I could have ignored it. You think, you know, one line, nobody but me will know it, but it just irked me so much. So what I did was I ended had them end up being uh, living with a bartender who who just cursed like that all the time, and so they just picked it up. You know, it was their first Earth, you know, humanism that they started to use, but it had nothing to do with them. And I went, oh, phew, I covered myself. But what else have I done like that? So now I'm obsessive. I mean, I just, I just research and research and research, and I just horrified. Because it, you're right, it, it becomes a problem later or an opportunity. That's when the flip side of it is the more information you can put in, the more backstory you can provide your characters, even your secondary characters like you did, the more you can mine later. You know, all of a sudden a secondary character takes the limelight. They have a story to tell, like Tybalt and, and Lisa, um, all that part. You know, that's rich. That's that's the whole point of having a series to me. Yeah, and I... I, the the continuity thing is, I think the first time I I ran into it way back, I was reading Isaac Asimov's uh, one of his uh, Opus One Hundred or Opus Two Hundred, I don't know, one of his autobiographical books, and he was talking about why he never finished the Foundation series, and it was because the the level of detail built up to the point where he felt kind of frozen by it, and oh, he had, uh -huh. he had yeah. to go back and reread and. And reread and try to make everything work, and uh, and he never finished the series as a result. So I don't know what they're going to do in the TV series, but huh, interesting. I actually uh, I, I lean on readers as well. I'm sure you do this too. I I uh, <clears throat> they're very kind to me, and I will throw out a question like, "How many eyes does this alien have?" to save me trying to find that answer and they'll come back and then you know usually within a day it's wonderful and they'll say this many eyes or they you never mention eyes so you're free and that's been that's been really helpful over the years i've talked to authors who have readers who are just really obsessive about that and they really rely on them to kind of keep track of all that stuff for them and yet even so in, in one book you can occasionally going and of course the best way to find prop mistakes in a book is to uh is to do a public reading somewhere <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you're reading a section and you think oh no <laughs> well let's just keep going on that fortunately I, I will say Daw is wonderful about letting us send in corrections and I haven't yet had to correct something like that but uh you know every time I read and I, I read aloud and you find a typo I'm going oh, okay yes let's let's just send that into poor Josh and it'll get fixed on the next edition so that's helpful well, I have someone um, doing the audiobook for Star Song, my young adult uh, science fiction novel, and she's finding a number of typos because she's reading it out loud. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it is a, it's certainly a great way to to find, you know, just on that level of where you dropped a word or something because your eyes see what you think should be there, not what's actually there. And it seems to be getting worse for me as I get older when I'm typing my my fingers will type the wrong word because it's like they got the first two letters and they thought oh i know what he's typing <laughs> it's like autofill yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is it's an autocorrect going on inside your head. my final proof that what works for me best is is i read backwards um so i'm not reading the sense of the sentence at all i'm just scanning the words themselves and and that helps yeah i've heard of that uh, that approach i've never i've never tried it so talking about characters uh how do you develop and how did you develop these characters? I mean, they're, they're very interesting characters, Killian, the pilot, and, and your arbiter, uh, and and Flip, of course, is a character. Do you do a lot of, uh, you know, 
character sheets and that sort of thing where you're, you're writing out details or uh, how does it work for you? Uh, they're not so much character sheets, although each, each I have a journal, as I said, and, and I make notes to make sure I remember that I've said that, you know, Henry wears sandals. So I wrote that in. Uh, so I remember later not to put him in shoes. So that kind of, of, of um, record keeping I do. I knew the type of person Henry had to be to do this job. And Killian was actually a very minor character to start with, but then she just got louder and bigger and more important. So I actually upped her role greatly. And, and as you know, she's at certainly equal status now. All the characters are. Beth was the one that just came to me just full on, uh, no work required. Uh, and I've never had to even write a passage of her more than once. Like she just falls out of my brain, which is a gift. It's always nice to have a pivotal character, uh, someone that you just uh, have no trouble, you know, being in their headspace. And and Henry was okay. Uh, it was more the case of making sure he was not just so much realistic, but that the difference between a person who manipulates and a person who is compassionate and understands people is a very thin line. And I wanted to make sure he you understood that he was not a manipulator in that sense of the negative sense. He was a manipulator in the sense of of the compassion. I, I think that comes across. Oh yes, oh. absolutely. Yeah, he uh, he's he's a very interesting character in that he's clearly brilliant at what he does, and uh, yeah, that he will go to the side of compassion over the side of cold logic uh, on occasion. Um, and then, of course, he he puts himself right there on the on the line at the end. So, oh, I meant to ask you. Uh, then, it, it was speaking of characters. I I was looking at your character names, but what really struck me were the names of your ships. There must well, be they were fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tried to find uh, names that made um, that really tied in. And of course, now that you say that, I can't remember them. But I remember researching them. Well, the Jean the Jean. Uh, Beret, I guess, uh, is a, a main character as well as a ship. Yes, um, and the Ernest Cox. Yeah, the, and I, yeah. I looked up um, Google is your friend. And I was uh -huh. looking for interesting names that that would resonate with what those ships did. And in the that the main ship um, that they end up on, the starship, it was I knew nothing about this character who had actually sailed. Uh, I think she sailed as a man. Um, and uh if and um you know in the 19th century or something like that and yeah she just seemed appropriate for the uh for the ship that that's i caught it because i knew they were important names because i was determined in this particular book that all of my names you, you asked if i did any prep and character sheets so one thing i did do was the names first and every name from new earth has three components a first name that your parents might give you a second name that you aspire to from the old earth archives and your third name is the name that basically applies to your uh genetic background you know the the, the cultural group the, the 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 genomic group that you come from so what i did was for example i've got uh killian her middle name is lamar and that's from the uh, actress Lamar, Lamar. Who was an inventor and, uh, and, you know, just a really creative person. And her last name is Brown and Brown is the most common surname in Australia. Well, you also had so a Hadfield. My... You had a Hadfield in there. Was I that a, a, a Hadfield, nod to Chris? Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> I did. I, and of course, you know where he came from and I have uh, Pearson. I have a, uh, a person who is assigned to the arbiter's office from the Peace Corps and his middle name is, uh, is Pearson after Lester B. Pearson. So right up front, I'm saying that these people, even though they're centuries away from their origin Earth, they have the archives intact and they value them enough to go in, find a person whose life resonates with them and accomplishments they want to emulate, and they keep that name. So I really like that idea. Plus, it also gave me a chance to have all kinds of diverse names. Like I've got names from Nigeria, names from from uh, that are Italian, Greek, all over the all over the place, and uh, they made me happy. So I, I actually looked up to make sure I got it right, but the Jean Beret, the uh, the, the starship, uh, 
The actual woman was a member of Louis Antoine de Bougainville's expedition on the ships La Boudoz and Etois. <laughs> My French is terrible. In 1766 to 1769, and is recognized as the first woman to have completed a voyage of circumnavigation of the globe. That's brilliant. You see, I knew they were important names. I, I just love that. And Ernest Cox was from Australia, I think. And uh, I don't remember the details now. I'd have to look him up too. But I remember thinking, oh, he's perfect for the name of the ship. So. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do that. Um, and it, it, it's happened to me a couple of times. You know, you know, does it happen to you? You're you're researching. Well, you mentioned actually the magma pots. You're doing some research and something says, oh, that's perfect. Um, mm -hmm. It's happened to me a couple of times when I was doing the Masks uh, trilogy. Um, I needed a um, way to get up and down inside this mine in that world. People actually mine magic. And I didn't want him just going up and down ladders because that was boring. So I went looking mm -hmm. and I found this uh, thing called a man engine, which was water driven and had reciprocating beams on a water wheel that would then transfer the reciprocation to vertical. And then you Isn't put awesome? platforms on them that would go up and down and they would meet and you would step from one platform to the next and get it taken down and, <laughs> and continue down that way. And it sounded terrifying, but it, it suddenly became a major thing in the in the book because I I discovered that in my research. Does that happen to you a lot? It happens to me in the fantasy a lot because uh, the Night's Edge series is set um, basically in the early 18th century in terms of technology. So there's a lot of, of, of detailed, clever um, ways of getting things done, of using mechanical advantage. I mean, there's one uh, country that has uh, steam engines. And so, we're, you know, you can see, and of course, my people are in a rural sit sitting, even though they know this tech. So what could they have brought with them and what do, how do they get things done? And the more I look for information, the more I find that that's I didn't know. And I respect the accomplishments that they had. And I pull that in and it's I, I feel much, much more genius than I ever did before. <laughs> <laughs> so, um what are you working on next? I am working on A Change of Place, and that is book three of Night's Edge. So it follows A Turn of Light, A Play of Shadow, A Change of Place. And so that's the next one. And it, <clears throat> pardon me, just, just flies right in right after the last book for those who are eagerly waiting for more House Toads and Dragons. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing it. How many will that be for you for Daw? Uh, that number, uh, I'm at 20, I had it in my head the other day, 23. I know that's another one of those questions. How many books have you written? Oh, uh, it's awful. I mean, I know Mage was number 20 and I said, I'll never forget that. But then I'm trying to think how many I've written since Mage. And it's, it's with this one, this one might be 25. Don't, don't come. You know, Kaylee can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Tangled Stars was my 12th for Daw, though not all under, have you ever written under pseudonym? I don't think so. No, no. I've been under, no. uh, I was E.C. Blake for the Masks of Agreement trilogy, and I did a standalone fantasy as Lee Arthur Chain. Um, I've also written outside of Daw. I'm, I'm also, <laughs> I'm a writer called Adam Blade, um, which is a house name for the Beast Wars children's fantasy books. And I did one of oh. those. And he has his own biography. He's described as a 20-something Englishman who likes to go rock climbing on the weekends and has a pet capuchin monkey. So that's oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a secret now. I mean, it's right there on the Wikipedia page. Right, There's what I'm one right of the authors there. listed. <laughs> it's right there. Oh, my gosh. No, I, although I, I remember two times that came up. And the, one, one, the first time was when I sold my first uh, science fiction novel to Daw. And at the time, I was doing uh, educational science books in Canada for Wiley and Sons. So I went to my editor there and I said, well, is, are you okay with me writing under Trinada? You know, if people will be able to find both. And she says, oh my gosh, yes, you have no idea how much better we feel knowing we have a real writer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was good. And then when I went to fantasy the first time, I asked Sheila, do you want me to, you I mean, I was not wanting to, but I would willingly do it if she thought it would be better. And she says, no, no, no. She said, you've got a good fan base. They'll come with you or most of them will come with you. And she was right. They did from the science fiction to the fantasy. So save me. I did want to put Elizabeth out in full and then that was quashed because that would just wreck the catalog. You know, you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my case, good... it was, I switched. My first two books were 
um, science fiction. Marcia Girl, which won the Aurora Award way back when. I was uh, there. And yeah, I was there too. I got a kiss from Robert J. Sawyer. Not everybody can say that. There you go. Um, and I, um, oh, and Sheila and Betsy were there too, which was great because it was yeah. in Montreal. So that was nice. They were all at the same table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then I switched to fantasy and that was Lee Arthur Chain. And then the next fantasy was different from that fantasy because it was more of a YA, much younger character. And so that's when I became E.C. Blake. And then I got to come back to Edward Willard when I went back to science fiction. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been interesting for a while. I I was I even did the E.C. Blake name tag at conventions, but that was just confusing. So, <laughs> oh yeah, but then when you sign things, you go. Uh, uh, oh, like what I've seen many. It's, what do you do? I sign E.C. Blake if they if they know me. I'll say it sometimes. Also say A.K.A. Edward Willett underneath it or something like that. Um, I've seen people write like their real name, writing as, and then the pseudonym. So they sign yeah, all would... the time their real name, and then un but then they act, they acknowledge the pseudonym right there as well. That so that might it's... be better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, your posterity, your legacy. There you go. You're so many people at once. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I contain multitudes. I am legion. Uh, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so well, have you been have you been pleased with the response to uh, to each his world? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, it was, it's like anything else, when you invest a lot of time and effort into a standalone book, uh, my experience has been, uh, you, you, you gathers uh, followers over the years, it's going to be there a while. And that's the nicest thing about a standalone is it has that um, staying power, because it's always brand new to somebody. It's not, oh, that's, it's part of that series. That being said, uh, immediately, of course, people say, would you write another one? But I think most people have, have grasped, and, and you can tell me if it feels that way, it feels like it ends where it should. Yeah, I mean, there's stories you could tell within that overarching story, but I, I think it it has a nice wrapping up. Um, and of course, you can always do a sequel. It's always possible to pull a thread out that you didn't completely resolve from somewhere in the book or expand something but it doesn't mean that you should necessarily. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I've, I've written several books in which I know I'm done and, and everything I could possibly put into it is there. And if people want to imagine and speculate beyond it, even me, that's fine. But that's the last time I'm going to write there. Uh, it, I could see writing in a different format for it. I don't know if, if it ever became a game. Maybe I might be intrigued to try to do something like that. But I think that I, I, when you start into it, knowing it's a standalone, it's a different flavor. Like you put everything in there, you wrap everything up with enough imaginative things left for other, for the reader to be excited when they stop. Um, the, only, the exceptions to that, well, I did that with Turn, which is really long, as you know, um, but the world building was so elaborate in, in turn that I had no trouble when Sheila said, would you like to do more there? And I would say, yes, there's so many I could do. But even then I, I sort of felt like there would only be so many. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. The one I did that I was completely convinced was a, a standalone and I haven't even been tempted was a book called the city born, which I felt uh, very much completed at the end. And there wasn't really anything interesting to do beyond that because the central mystery is solved and, Mm -hmm. the characters the characters end up literally uh they they have some sort of special abilities and those of all those are all gone they end up with stripped of their special abilities and actually start naked at the end of the book so <laughs> i guess there are places to go from there but I, I presume at the very least shopping <laughs> <laughs> yeah shopping would be the next thing but no that that was the one for sure that i felt was completely i was asked once though um uh, Bundoran Press that Hayden Trenholm ran mm -hmm. uh, had published a book of mine called Right to Know, which was an old one of mine that uh, he picked up and I'd rewritten. It was so old. It was so old that uh, it was set on a starship, but I hadn't anticipated the World Wide Web. And so it was like broadcast media was my my model that I was going with. And I had to realize that there were other ways of communicating through online and stuff because it was written back when I was quite young. Uh, but anyway, he and then he asked me for a sequel, and I had never thought of a sequel, but I was able to go in and pull something out. But it ended up not really being the, the same characters. It was like several years in the future, new characters, 
um, and things like that. So I guess that's that certainly is always probably a possibility, no matter how complete it feels. The world is still there and you could tell another story in the world. You could. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whether you want to or not. <laughs> I'm just reminded of uh, what happened with my very first book, A Thousand Words for a Stranger. Uh, I I left it, you know, very much up in the air. And and yet it's a satisfying ending. I think every book has to have a satisfying ending. But then I, I by the time I wrote the sequel uh, to it, as she, you know, Sheila and I had agreed to do, I realized if I was going to actually do it, proper science fiction treatment of this story it was going to take nine books not not ten not eight nine books three trilogies and it did and now now that i'm done i'm done with that and uh, I, I i write some little you mentioned writing stories in a setting so tales from plexus is an anthology i did where other people wrote there as well as me and that's been fun and i'd like to do another one of those but that's picking a specific moment in which everything's kind of free and easy and there's no big consequences yet but the entire series, you had I had to deal with all the biggest consequences, and to that point, it felt done. It was quite a quite a a moment when I wrote the last word of the last book. It really was. Um, you write long books. <laughs> uh, what's the longest? Right, you've, <laughs> what's, the, what's the longest you've written? A turn. Um, it's three hundred fifty thousand words. Ooh. Or a bit more than that. That's at least two novels for anybody else. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was my first kick at fantasy. I wanted to do my very best job, and I just lost myself in it for three years. And I was, I totally reinvented how I wrote to do it. And I'm very pleased with it. It's, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't read like a long book. To me, it reads like you could open it anywhere and, and read three or four pages and walk away happy, um, which is a nice thing about a fantasy novel with a big setting. But it is a, I, I do make an effort to tighten up and, and certainly my shortest book is I think Gosper Mage and I work very hard on making that tight and, and narrow and, and very focused. So it, it depends on the story. We both bounced back and forth from fantasy to science fiction. Do you feel you have a natural home in one or the other? No, because I, I find them so different. I find them different to read. I find them different to write. Um, I find that it is, I snap back like in an elastic way to writing science fiction after fantasy, probably because that's most of what I've done, but also being a, a trained in science, it's my uh, my jam. When I go to write fantasy, it's it's something I take much more to heart, the fact that they, I don't know everything about it and I'm constantly learning how to do it. So I am getting braver. So they're very different. So it, I find this good for my brain. And I, I felt like after four years of, of, of science fiction, I was more than ready to go two and a half years in fantasy, which is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I've, um, I always thought of, I was going to be a science fiction writer, probably a hard science fiction writer. Um, first short story I sold wasn't science fiction at all. And then the early ones were science fiction. But uh, but I always loved fantasy too, and at, at some point, I I just kind of I just well, you tell it both. It just depends so well. on what the story is. <laughs> yeah, it does, and and you do both well. I mean, I've only had one. I had a I wrote a, a short story for uh, an anthology that I was invited to, and I thought, well, this is great. I love this idea. It's kind of hard to do, but I did it. And the editor came back to me, kind of you know, apologetic, and said, "Can we hang on to this for another anthology because it's supposed to be science?" A fantasy and you wrote science fiction and I said well give me a couple of days <laughs> and I took it back and I thought can this work in fantasy I've never tried to do this before it was kind of an, a challenge and it actually was better as fantasy almost a, like a dark fantasy almost to a horror and, and I sent it back in and it was published and I went sometimes you know you, you're not telling the story the way the story needs to be told as you say it well and sometimes it's hard to tell I mean the the series before this one, uh, The World Shapers, which went to three books, and at some point I hope to continue it, um, is marketed. It's often called a portal fantasy, but in fact, the underpinnings are entirely science fiction. It's alien super technology that's mm -hmm. underneath everything, and that's made very clear. Uh, but it's it reads like a portal fantasy because the character's going into different worlds, and yet these worlds are not fantasy worlds necessarily. There's the steampunk world is one, mm -hmm. and our own, a version of our own world is the first one. 
So uh, well, I, I think that's that a marketing a, problem. <laughs> yeah, because to me, portal fantasy is fa is is fantasy, and gate stories are um, science fiction. I mean, Andre Norton wrote many gate stories and and portal stories, and they're very distinct. You know, one you clearly have technology, and the other one you clearly have a magical uh, you know moment in which you're transiting between dimensions. And uh, now that we have multiverses and everything else, you shouldn't have any trouble marketing. You see, you call them multiverse stories. Yeah, exactly, and they all kind of well, it's like. You know, alternate history for some reason is considered science fiction, and I think that's because yeah. of the multiverse. But really, it's a form of fantasy as often as not, because it's imagining the world with different rules or different things that happen. So, well, I'm not so, good. At, not good alternate history. I mean, there's alternate history fantasy and alternate history science fiction, and alternate history science fiction is actually so much more rigorous. It's actually more convincing, and it always worries me that people will think this is actually how things happened. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Of work in that yeah yeah now did you want me to try putting the video back on and see if we've got a better signal now maybe some kids have stopped using the internet <laughs> sure put it back on and we can finish up here with a little video that we may be able to pull out and... so far so good all right let me get mine back on here so this is the journal i was talking about that i made for each and i actually we were talking about how these things came to be, and I actually uh, spent the beginning of it actually mapping out what I needed in the journal for it. So every page is, is uh, has been very important. So that's for the book. <clears throat> nothing like that I can show. There is, there's never a, pe there's that few pages of synopsis, which I will carry with me in my computer bag and never look at unless I run into trouble. And yes. then I'll look at it and I'll think, oh, that's what I intended to do. And But very rarely have I, Sometimes I've had to back up and maybe pick up some of those threads and go forward, but it's like the that old thing about no uh, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. No no plan True. survives contact with the actual writing process, as far as I can tell. <laughs> I find for me that, that the I don't necessarily go back to it. It's like studying for an exam, but certainly in the series, it's I do. But I find it often opens up other ideas. So if I'm stuck on how to get from from A to B. I'll go through my journal to see if I considered that problem before and I'll find something, an idea I abandoned and I have just written it down in there and I'll say, that'll work. And it saved me many, many times to just throw everything into the journal, even if I'm not sure I'll ever use it. And it becomes a, a, a very appropriate focus source of material. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You had mentioned the, the character uh, Killian, the pilot and how she yes. grew. Does that happen to you often? A character that you didn't think was going to be central or important becomes central or important has that happened to you often not often um i'm, I'm really kind of a, a control freak when it comes to the story <laughs> and what characters are doing i'm not one of those people that say oh they woke me up and they want to do something else i'll not kill them then <laughs> um but every once in a while an opportunity shows up and you see it happen and you say i'm going to run with that and it's uh, it happened in uh, to tr ties of power actually. I wrote I had to write the third book of the trilogy because I had a character and I contacted Sheila and I said he just won't you know I just he's he's got to die some other way he can't just he's got to continue into something else and because he's is more invested here in this character than I thought when I started. So sometimes I'm surprised, but not that often. I hope it makes me more comfortable to know what they're going to do and to be sure that their roles than it is to be surprised. I the think plot surprises me. <laughs> I think the time or two I've I've grown a character, it's been because of a plot need. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I had one. Um, I can't remember which. I guess it was uh, Terry and Segura, which was the second book in my duology, my third book for Daw. Um, and I desperately needed to have a viewpoint character somewhere where I did not have a viewpoint character, so I had to create a viewpoint character, and he actually became uh, quite important and because i had created him that was one of the occasions where i got about two-thirds of the way in and i said this book is not going to end the way i put it in the synopsis it's it just can't and i had to no. replot from there to the end but it was better than it would have been before and it was entirely because of that that plot issue that i was solving by creating a character well, um, that's how things become original isn't it but you reminded me i do have one character who got famous because he was so popular and I made up a giant lobster to run a restaurant in my first book partly because I was really annoyed with my biology professor and the math that they were showing about exoskeletons I said you can make a kite in this creature so I made him look like a lobster and off we went he got so much fan mail 
And still to this day, I'm not allowed to do anything that doesn't include him because there's so many, so many people are attached to this character that that wasn't me. I didn't do that, but uh, I, I know they love him. So I throw him in every time I get a chance. So that's fun. Hey, have you ever done talking squids in outer space as Margaret Atwood famously referred to science fiction? <laughs> <laughs> Have I done talking squids in outer space? Well, they wouldn't, they'd be in a suit. I've certainly done talking shrimp. So there you go. Well, I was in Lost in Translation, which was my very first book that Daw picked up. Um, I hadn't even thought about it, but it's a bunch of alien races. And one of them was a tentacled alien who, you know, lived underwater or wore a, a suit of some sort, if, if you know, like a space suit equivalent. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me at the time that she said that, that I had literally written a book with a talking squid in outer space in it. And I was proud of it, too. <laughs> and you said so you should be. Actually, one of the most interesting little tidbits I put away in for a future book is that they've discovered that uh, the, the arms of an octopus are semi-autonomous. Like They make the decisions within each arm, which way to go, what color to be. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it is cool. I mean, it's basically a, it's basically a hive mind going on. Every once in a while, the main brain just sort of says something for everybody. But most of the time, they're acting on their own. And I'm thinking, oh, that's so great. I can't wait to write that. One day. That's not a fantasy thing. Well, we've uh, we've talked for most of an hour, I think. So maybe we should uh, wrap it up. So I'm going to wrap it up. And then you can wrap it up. by uh, Since we're actually talking about each other's books, I'm going to tell you... Uh, that and tell everybody that they should read to each his world it has fascinating characters and um, just amazing thought that has gone into the creation of these worlds and the aliens and the biology involved it's a big mystery at the middle of it you're trying to figure out all the way through along with the characters exactly what uh, what these aliens want and how this is all going to play out for humanity um Great characters, great adventure. That last bit of the chase across the planet where you originally started is great old-fashioned science fiction adventure for sure and lots of sense of wonder. So everyone should read To Each His World by Julie Shredata. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ed. That means a lot. Um, and everyone should read The Tangled Stars, which is not The Tangled Web, uh, <laughs> The Tangled Stars by Ed Willett from Daw. And part of it is because it's got a wonderful romance inside. It has characters with, with true heart. It has a cat that, if you know cats, comes across incredibly real. But also, if you really like your AI, just a little twisty. It's got some very cool ideas, big ideas about uh, where we will be in the future with artificial intelligence and when we will be not with, or hope not. Also, it's it's got lots of chase, lots of running and chasing and starships and and clever, clever plots. And I, I really did enjoy that aspect of it very much. So well done, Ed. And I highly recommend The Tangled Stars by Ed Willett from Daw. Okay. Thank you, Julie. And I guess that's uh, that's it for this very special episode of The World Shapers. So uh, thanks for listening in. And um, I, I have many more great interviews coming up. So uh, you can find The World Shapers at theworldshapers.com. All the back episodes are there, including the original episode with Julie Sharnada back in 2018. Uh, and uh, many other wonderful authors that I've talked to and will continue to talk to into the future. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.